and I hear the either a tornado or the noon whistle here. So uh, we will kick this off. And uh, again, uh, welcome all the folks that are with us. We appreciate your attendance very much. This is Steve Larson here with the Horst Dairyman staff up in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Uh, we're uh, very pleased to have with us today Bill Weiss from the Ohio State University. I'm sure Mike will have a comment about that later. And uh, be talking about an update on the mineral nutrition. Certainly Bill is one of the go-to people on this topic uh, across the country. We also want to uh, thank Zinpro for their support and sponsorship of this webinar here today. Uh, so with that comment, I'll introduce our co-host, Mike Hutchins, down at the University of Illinois. Mike, go ahead. Very, very good, Steve. Thanks much. And as always, a pleasure to uh, rejoin the uh, and, and be part of the uh, Hordes Darien webinar. I know we're in, in finishing up our, our third year, and it's an exciting uh, way to deliver neat information to our uh, dairy producers and dairy professionals here around the world. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our, our, uh, our uh, webinar leader for the day, Dr. Bill Weiss. He is professor of dairy cattle nutrition in the, in the Department of of Animal Sciences at The Ohio State University. Of course, this is Mike Cutchins from The University of Illinois, but we'll move on from there. Seriously, uh, uh, Bill received his bachelor's and master's degree uh, from Purdue University and then a PhD from uh, The Ohio State University. And in uh, 1989, he joined the, the, the faculty there at The Ohio State University with a joint research and teaching appointment. Uh, his major areas of effort include feed efficiency and dairy efficiency of dairy cattle, relationships of minerals and vitamins, which he's going to talk to us a little bit about today. And thirdly, another major area is looking at diet variability. Many of you have seen our, his articles there as well. Uh, Bill uh, has done a number of, received a number of prestigious awards. He was a member of the 2001 Dairy NRC Committee and has uh, published well in excess of 100 journal articles. And is, you'll see him all over the world speaking on, uh, on dairy nutrition and management. So with that introduction, Dr. Bill Weiss, we'll turn the program over to you. And uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Steve, and, and thanks, ZenPro, for the sponsoring this seminar. I'd just like to start. I, I just worked for The Ohio State University. I didn't come up with the name. <laughs> okay. Um, this is going to be an update. It cannot be everything because this is such a huge topic. So what I'm going to talk about today is first I want to go over some of the basics on how requirements are actually established because you're going to see there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge and I want you to understand where my recommendations are coming from and where you might disagree with me um, because these are not set in concrete. Then I'm going to give an update on just certain minerals. Again, I picked these for reasons I'll explain in a bit and one thing I want to be very, very clear on is my recommendations are limited to lactating cows in this seminar, not dry cows. They have very different mineral requirements and what I'm saying for lactating cows may or may not work for dry cows. So remember lactating cows. And then uh, as I go through this I'm going to give, come up with uh, my guidelines for formulating diets with respect to that class of minerals in point two. Uh, I'd like to start here just to find out where, where you're at. So I've listed uh, four different uh, approaches to mineral nutrition. We'll give you a poll, just a couple seconds here to fill in the poll. Well, very good, Bill. I think this will be kind of fun to see. Okay. Uh, uh, Steve and I, uh, Steve, uh, well, let's read these quickly as people are starting well, to start yeah. voting here. Uh, the first one means you substantially exceed the NRC guidelines on all minerals. You just meet NRC guidelines. You <laughs> only overfeed specific minerals, or you adjust uh, farm by farm and mineral by mineral basis. That's kind of fun to look at. Uh, Steve, uh, do you, have yeah. you uh, at Hordes Boy, Dairyman, I, where, where are you? I guess uh, I might... Uh, Pick number one, just uh, like wearing belt and a suspenders, both something like that. But, oh, golly, <laughs> I'm not a very popular choice. So, so. okay, I've uh, Jim. I'm not seeing our, our votes uh, at this point yet. Uh, are they up here? Uh, I'm seeing sixty some percent, Mike. Six, about two thirds. Oh yeah, I so see far. it. No, yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. Wow, we yeah, you know what I, you know Steve, I'm I, I'm going to lose here as well because uh, oh, yeah. uh, I I would have went with you there except for phosphorus. I I think I I'm kind of in that first category. Anyway, Bill, can you see the the results oh, there? Yeah, yes, I can. Well, we're going to close okay. the poll. So, what okay. do you think? Any any comments on the it's, poll? It makes me wonder if I need to give this seminar because they picked the right answer, or most Ooh. people did. <laughs> well, just go uh, through it for Steve and I. Okay, but <laughs> yeah, there is between the first and second 
point there. There is some important considerations, and, and I think I would have gone a little heavier to the first point rather than the second one, and I'll explain that reasoning as we go through. Um, let's start with how these requirements come up with. First of all, I'm going to stick to NRC, and the reason for that is virtually every software package available in the U.S. and probably around the world rely very heavily on NRC for minerals and vitamins. And even though they may have some different equations and all, the, the backbone of it is probably NRC. Now what's showing here is that the classical requirement model, even though we know there's some issues with it, but basically we conduct experiments, we feed more and more of whatever we're interested in a mineral. In this example, we increase tissue supply we measure something when we maximize that response it, that's the requirement at this this point here then we go we feed more and more nothing happens and eventually especially with minerals but all nutrients we're going to come to a point where things start going south and for minerals this is called the maximum tolerable level or the MTL MDL this is not acute toxicity. It might be. It might be nothing more than the cows back off on feed and reduce the milk production. So it's just the point where we start seeing negatives, but it may or may not be true toxicity. Problem with minerals are we really don't know for a lot of these minerals what's the true mineral supply. We can know how much we're feeding these cows, but how much are actually getting absorbed into the, the cell of interest. The other big problem is we don't really know what to measure, what response, and, and so we have two unknowns here and we're trying to get requirements. And so we have to look at this as not a specific number. There's a lot of uncertainties both in where we should be for requirements, but also uncertainty on where we start seeing problems. And, and we have to remember with minerals especially, too much is too much, not enough is not enough. There's, a, there's an optimum. We can't keep feeding more for a variety of reasons. On the requirements end, on what do we measure? Here's just a list of possible measurements. I think the vast majority of people now in dairy nutrition would say we can no longer simply feed enough of mineral to prevent classical deficiency. In other words, feed enough magnesium so we prevent grass tetany or feed enough selenium so we prevent white muscle disease. We, we realize those are not sensitive enough. Minerals are needed for other things. We have production here. Minerals are not highly related to milk production, or that's not a sensitive measure. We can, if I quit feeding sodium today, they will drop almost immediately, but if I quit feeding copper, I might not see a mineral response for weeks or months. So production is not a really efficient measure. Repro, um, we have the issue of we need so many cows, um, and then if you have multiple treatments, they just become unrealistic, the experiments. General health is awful vague. What's, you know, what, is mineral, what is bad health caused by a mineral, and what's bad health caused by something else? Immune function has some potential here. This is something we can measure in the lab. Um, we can, it takes a reasonable amount of cows. But again, there's always the question, what happens in the test tube? Is that applicable to a cow? There's some data showing there's at least relationships, but again, is it exact? And then lastly, do we just measure tissue or blood? Is that the requirement? And probably not. So there's a lot of unknowns here, and we have to look at a lot of different things when we're coming up with requirements, because it is not straightforward. The requirement for most minerals in NRC uh, in 2001 adopted the factorial approach. And what that means is there's requirements for various functions of these cows. We have maintenance, and I, I'm going to go into a little more detail on some of these in a bit, but maintenance requirement is mostly a function of body weight, and for some of them it's uh, dry matter intake. Phosphorus is related to intake, phosphorus requirement. The gestation requirement is simply the amount of mineral deposited in the fetus or the associated tissue, uh, placenta, so on. And that's all it is. It's if the, the calf is born with 20 milligrams of copper, the requirement for gestation was approximately 20 milligrams. It is not the copper required to synthesize. It's the copper retained in the fetus. 
and that's strictly a function of, of, of some of body weight of the cow but also days pregnant. Growth is simply again the mineral accreted in tissue. If a heifer is gaining a pound a day and that pound has uh, half a milligram of selenium, its requirement for growth is half a milligram of selenium. For the NRC it's based on age but it also can be average daily gain and so on. And this is growth, this is not fattening. And then lastly the one we're most interested in is lactation requirement and again this is simply the mineral secreted in milk. Um, if, if so many grams of calcium is secreted in milk each day that's the calcium requirement for lactation. And we simply add up these milligrams or grams of each of these and th this is remember this is what's actually put out in the product except for maintenance and that's the total absorbed requirement. And again if you think uh, along the lines of, of energy, net energy, this is net energy or we go from metabolizable energy to net energy and there's an efficiency there. With minerals we're going essentially from absorbed or digestible uh, it's equivalent to digestible energy. Absorbed mineral is used with a hundred percent efficiency, whereas for protein and energy, we do not give it a hundred percent. And you, you'll see where I think this may be an issue. This maintenance requirement is quite difficult, and it's also important for for various minerals. Somewhere between thirty and fifty percent of the total requirement for for these minerals, different minerals is maintenance. So it's not a trivial requirement. It's a, it's, it's a very large requirement. And if we're wrong, then it's going to show up in the requirements. The classical definition, and if you read NRC and you read other, other textbooks on requirements, the maintenance requirement is the amount of nutrient, and in this case mineral, that is inevitably lost and that must be replaced for a non-pregnant, non-growing, non-lactating animal. And what this means is if, if I could feed a cow in the short term a diet totally void of copper, which is not possible, but if we could, and then for a short period of time I measured uh, copper in feces and copper in urine, those are what I have to replace those every day. Those are being inevitably lost. And that would be the maintenance requirement. But look at definition two, which is not at all the same. It's the minimum amount of a mineral needed to maintain body function and health without reducing body stores in a non-pregnant, non-growing, not lactating cow. These are two very, very different things. Uh, selenium is a good example. I can feed a diet essentially devoid of selenium, and I, I'll measure almost no selenium in feces, and I'll measure, but I will measure selenium lost in urine. And the amount lost in urine depends on selenium status. If this cow has good glutathione peroxidase levels, a good selenium status, when I withdraw the selenium from the diet, she will excrete more in the urine than one that's deficient in selenium. So the question is, is this definition here, definition one, does it really reflect optimal status? And I think for many, many minerals, that's, it does not. Definition two is actually a much better definition. It's still extremely difficult to measure. So I have some concerns with the way the data are on, on current requirements. We have this maintenance versus health. And again, I think overall the maintenance requirement as currently estimated is probably underestimating requirements, especially for trace, new, trace minerals less so for, for the major minerals. Then we have this, this thing on lactation. Is there a cost in mineral to produce milk? And not just the, the mineral that is secreted in milk. And again, a very good example of this is copper. Copper ha milk has a certain amount of copper and that they're in, in their, the milk has a certain concentration of copper and that's covered by the lactation requirement. But copper is a component of an enzyme SOD, superoxide dismutase, which should be produced in proportion to oxygen consumption. High producing cows consume a lot more oxygen than low producing cows. Does that mean high producing cows need more copper for the superoxide to handle all that oxidative stress? Currently there's no cost to synthesis, it's simply secretion. 
and we have the same argument with reproduction. Is there a mineral cost for a cow to become pregnant, not grow the fetus? This is again is is if a mineral is deficient, will she, ovulation or something else be not normal, not optimal, and will we see a a, a reduction in reproductive efficiency? And you'll see no likely errors where it's less or where where we're overestimating requirement. Where you, at best we're equaling requirement, but I think there's a lot of these situations, maintenance and milk production, where we're likely underestimating the true requirement. And again, this is especially true for trace minerals. On the other side of the equation, the NRC is adopted in 2001, took a, a big step forward and adopted some variable um, absorption coefficients. In the past, all minerals were, all of calcium, for example, was assumed to be a certain absorbability. With the new model, it's, it's not new anymore, but with the 2001 model, now there is some variability. Different supplements, different feeds have different absorption coefficients for different minerals. And so we, we can measure the mineral in the feed, we can apply a, a, a availability coefficient or absorption coefficient, and that will give us the, an estimate of how many grams or milligrams of mineral X the cow actually absorbs under those conditions. So the theory here is very, very good. It's a big advance. There are some issues though. This is, I'm just showing here uh, magnesium as an example. These are right out of the book. And what they're saying is that on average feeds, non-supplements, non-magnesium supplements, but corn, alfalfa, so on, on average, the magnesium in feeds is 16% available. And as an as a average number, that's very good. It, it fits mixed diets quite well. It may be, corn may have a very different number from soybean meal. That we don't know, but we don't feed diets of 100% corn or 100% soy. So for mixed diets, on average, this 16 is quite good, I think. Then they have different coefficients for different supplements. And again, in this example, I'm just talking about magnesium. Say dolomitic lime is 30% available. The magnesium in it, magnesium oxide, the, the primary source of supplemental magnesium in the U.S. is 70%, mag sulfate at 90. A problem, though, is all magnesium oxide is not the same. This is an old study, and these the numbers I'm showing are not availability coefficients. In other words, this purple bar here is not 100% available. What I did was simply put these different magnesium oxide sources, uh, because of the data that, that was available, I put them on a scale relative to the best. So the, the average here is 70, so this green bar might approximate the average um, mag ox. It may or may not, but let's just say it does. That means there would be magnesium oxide sources out there that are probably 50 percent more available than average. And on the other hand, there's magnesium oxides out there that are 80 percent less available than average. Currently, NRC, it's 0.7. The problem is, is there isn't good test that NRC could have applied so that if you have this blue magnesium oxide you know it's not very available and you either get a different source or increased supplementation rate. So one advance that might need to be made is somehow tie in some in, vi in vitro tests or lab tests that we can try to put some variability in these numbers. Not just for magnesium but for all of them. So the absorption coefficient is a big advance, but at the same time, it's also a weak link. These are not easy to measure. We can be critical of these numbers, but this is extremely difficult to measure. It's, it's not merely measuring how much of mineral X is consumed and how much of mineral X ends up in the feces. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, some, some minerals, the amount absorbed is regulated, so if you feed more, you absorb less. So what's the true availability? For other minerals, 
the the mineral may be absorbed, but then the animal secretes it excretes it back into the feces to maintain body status. So these are very very difficult to measure, and because they're so difficult, the numbers we have the real numbers, actual availability coefficients for these different minerals are extremely limited not only among sources but you have to remember there's interactions between diet and source and probably animal so if you're feeding one source of copper in a certain diet its availability coefficient might be very different when I put it in a different diet with different antagonists so again there's uh, some adjustments here that have to be made based on a lot basically on experience and know-how because we do not have the the quantitative models to estimate this and lastly these numbers have a huge effect which I'm going to show briefly here this is a very simple example uh, I'm not going to go into details this cow has a requirement for absorbed copper of about 10 milligrams a day and all I did was have one example where I have higher than average basal availability with higher than a average copper sulfate availability. For me to meet this requirement with these conditions and you can see in the red box are my the low low availability for basal the 0.05 is the high and then the same for the copper and these are not very big number very big differences uh, proportionately they're quite big but quantitatively they're extremely small and a lot of times we could not even experimentally measure these differences. But with high a basal and high copper sulfate availability, a diet with nine parts per million would meet this requirement. And I'd have to feed, in this example, 49 milligrams of copper sulfate. If I go to low basal and low copper uh, sulfate av availability, which again are not that different, I now need a diet of 13 parts per million, which is 1.4 times higher or I have to feed about 450 milligrams of copper sulfate per day to meet that requirement which is nine times so these numbers uh, especially for the traces because they're really small small differences have a tremendous impact on supplementation so all this was just to convince you that there's substantial uncertainty in these requirements and substantial uncertainty in absorption and when you formulate for for minerals what you're really doing is risk management what's the cost I, I say if you are doing if you're wrong I actually should say when you're wrong because it's going to happen and you have to ask is it worse to underfeed a mineral or overfeed a mineral what's the cost and there's various costs here: the cost of the supplement the cost of health issues if you don't feed enough the cost of health issues if you feed too much so you as a nutritionist have to look at the risk. Where, where's the biggest risk? Where's the biggest cost? These are what I'm going to talk about. Um, again, reminding lactating cows only. The reason I picked this list of minerals is, one, is there's some newer data since NRC came out. Some of these are emerging issues, uh, which I want to talk about. And then in the other, the other part is some of these actually have some real-world deficiencies. I'm just going to run through these phosphorus, and I'm going to try to give both sides of the point of the coin and end up where I think we should be. Many out there say we should feed phosphorus just at requirement, and the, the NRC requirement is approximately this varies depending on some issues. So these are just ballpark approximations, but you should feed right at requirements. Uh, for environmental issues, if you feed more phosphorus than the cow needs, it goes right out in manure. There is absolutely no data showing feeding more has any positive production production effects or reproduction effects. It, what we, if you meet NRC, you don't expect any more response and feed cost. If you su have to buy supplemental phosphorus, feed costs will go up. And I just showed an example here with Ohio prices. If I raise go from 0.38 phosphorus to 0.44 using monosodium phosphate that's about 20 cents a day so there's good reasons to feed right at requirement on the other hand there's legitimate reasons to exceed requirement one is there's this study here uh, from Wu long term this was months this was not days or weeks 
But long-term feeding at 15% less than NRC, which is cutting it pretty close, they lost milk. So again, if there's some uncertainties here and the, the margin of safety is only 15%, that might say I should feed a little more. Manure phosphorus is only a problem, is only an environmental issue if we can't use it efficiently on plants and crops. So if you have a lot of land that's growing a lot of corn, needs phosphorus, it's a very good sort of manure so it can be an excellent source of phosphorus. And then on the other hand, I just said phosphorus can increase feed costs. High phosphorus diets also tend to be cheaper than low phosphorus diets when the phosphorus comes from byproducts. So high byproduct diets you might need more or you might have more phosphorus, they might be cheaper. So here's the range, it's huge. Um, there is, if you have to buy supplemental phosphorus, you should be at NRC. There's no reason to buy more, so, more phosphorus. But if you have uh, byproducts, if your environmental regulations are such, and you have a way to effect, efficiently use that phosphorus, there's no problem, for, I should say, for the crops to efficiently use that phosphorus. There's no problem defeating high, high phosphorus diets. But don't buy supplemental phosphorus to do that. Okay, time for a little break here on, on a poll. We have another one now that deals with distiller grain. So I'll turn it back over to Mike. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, let's, uh, I think people can see that uh, if it distills grain. So you have five choices. Now, oh, boy, it gets to come, uh, Steve, this will be tough. you got five of them. Number one, don't make any specific harder. modifications, mineral supplement for one choice. Increase supplement of copper and change to more available sources. Third choice, add sodium and or potassium to increase the decad. Uh, change from inorganic selenium to selenium yeast. Increase calcium diets because of the high phosphorus. Holy smoke. I tell you, this is tough. Steve, do you have one? Well, this is why we hired nutritionists instead of relying on our own uh, expertise, of course. Well, so I know which I one I really, picked. But do, you? Good. Do, do, you, do you have one, Steve? Uh, no, I really don't. I'm watching the voting, though. And, you know, that's coming in a little slow today. This, yeah, uh, this is a tough this question, question it is. I think. Yeah. It's come on, come on, come on, you exactly. Republicans. Loosen up out there. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, let's get on board here. Coming up there. Yeah, yeah, I tell you, tell you, if Obama was here, he he'd have voted three times by now. There's no question <laughs> about that. But. At least. Well, I tell you, I'm I, I'm with the majority here, uh, Bill. If if that's important, but uh, we're going to stop because we're going to run okay. out of time here. Uh, okay. to close the polls, Jim. And um, what do you think, Bill? Well, the big question is is its inclusion rate. Right? If you're feeding very low amounts, uh, the first choice is obviously fine. You're feeding more, though. These other ones you have to do, and actually the, the answer that got the most, the last one, is probably the least important of these. Uh, with lactating cows, uh, calcium-phosphorus ratios really aren't that important. Dry cows are a different question. We'll get into some of this as we go through here. On potassium, um, requirements 1.1. There's arguments increase then. That's not enough. Based on data, um, it can improve milk fat, and this is likely a decad. It can help with heat stress. That may be potassium. It may also be related to decad. And there's some older data just saying uh, the optimal is higher than what NRC is showing. On the downside, we know K or potassium interferes with magnesium. It also increases manure output and potassium in manure, which could lead to this big cycle of higher and higher K in the plants. Uh, this is some older data, and I, I purposely don't have units over here because I just want you to look at the response functions. NRC is here at about 1.1, and you can see fat-corrected milk yield was optimal at levels higher than 1.1 in the winter. In the summer, it was tended to be linear and kept going up, up to 1.75. That's milk yield, and then DMI continued going up uh, in summer in a linear fashion. So this data would suggest NRC might be a little too low. Newer data is showing some of the same thing here. These are uh, some, this is data out of Washington State. Control was above NRC. They added potassium carbonate, not chloride. So they're changing both the decad and level potassium. That's important here. Uh, again, most people would say it's the decad, not necessarily the K. You see uh, no significant increase in milk, uh, trend for upward more milk, higher fat, significantly higher fat, 
and then a significantly improved six or seven percent increase in feed efficiency. This increase in feed efficiency was also found in a study in from Maryland. Uh, so there's two studies with early lactation, high producing cows. This is a study we did about a year or so ago, and these were medium, uh, mid lactation cows. And we did, in this study, we had a very high distillers diet 27% distillers, and this distillers had a lot of sulfur. So our control, which met potassium requirement per NRC, it only had a decat of two uh, because of this high sulfur. That's very, very low. We added potassium carbonate, got the K up to 2.2, the DCAT up to 30. We found a significant reduction in dry matter intake, which I cannot explain. We found an increase in milk fat, just like the Washington study. And again, we found about a 6% improvement in feed efficiency. So there's three studies showing increased in feed efficiency. Uh, mode of action is uncertain. It may have to, just have to do with water intake, but the actual mode of action is not clear. On the downside, if you feed more K, you are going to get more manure. And you're going to have more K in that manure. So if I'm at NRC here at 1.1 and I go up to 1.5 or 1.6, we expect an average of about 28 pounds more manure. They're going to drink more and they urinate a lot more. And so you have 100 cows, that's more than a ton of manure a day extra. And there's a cost to that. So be aware that nothing is ever simple. K clearly inhibits um, magnesium absorption. It, this occurs in the room and it's been known for a long time. And as you increase diet K, we reduce absorption of magnesium. Which means if, if you're at, based on this relationship we came up with several years ago, if you're feeding about NRC at 1% K, you, a diet of 0.23 mag is more than enough. If you feed a higher K, 1.8, you have to bump magnesium up substantially to 0.3. So again, this has to be factored in on, on the cost. The, you're going to get probably get increased feed efficiency, maybe more milk fat. There is some cost. So I think there's legitimate reasons to have NRC a little higher on K. And this still doesn't mean a lot of animals will need any supplemental K because the basal diet should be fine. I won't go into this. Heat stress, they lose a lot more K. There's good data that says these diets should be substantially higher than NRC with K, with heat stress. And NRC ad adjust for heat stress as well. Uh, a lot of this is likely a DCAD response, not a K. So remember, K chloride probably will not give their same response as K carbonate. Up magnesium, and remember the manure cost. For mag, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we need to feed more magnesium, both to dry and lactating cows. And I have rather substantial safety margins here, 40 to 70 percent above NRC. So instead of in the, the high teens, I'm going to be in the low 0.2 range. The reason or my logic for this is this potassium problem. Diets tend to be higher in K. There's potential improvement in milk fat, which I won't show. There's this issue on the variability in the quality of magnesium oxide and the availability of that magnesium. If you get a bad source of magnesium, you, you uh, could be in trouble. And there's no real nutrition risk to feeding these levels. There is a feed cost risk, but there's no real nutrition risk. So I, I, I think I would feed more magnesium. Sulfur. <laughs> This one, the requirement is 0.2, and there's absolutely no data to justify feeding more. Most diets are going to contain about this much. The negative, it reduces copper availability, uh, reduces selenium availability, reduces decay. The only plus is because of byproducts, especially distillers, which are high sulfur, these diets may be cheaper. High sulfur diets may be a little cheaper but there's a lot of negatives. I, I want to just quickly remind people that sulfur is an antagonist to copper and it's an antagonist to copper even without molybdenum. Many people think I need high molybdenum and high sulfur. No, high sulfur by itself is an issue. This is a beef study, two levels, they fertilize the, the pasture, got two levels of sulfur in the forages that these uh, beef cows were grazing. 
molybdenum was not an issue in these these diets very very significant reduction in liver copper stores with the sulfur high sulfur reduces copper so be aware if you're feeding a lot of distillers you might want to increase copper or switch to high availability copper some work we did higher sulfur lower selenium absorption about a 20 percent reduction in selenium absorption at 0.6 percent dietary sulfur so again with high sulfur diets distillers and so on think about switching to yeast rather than selenite in general like I said sulfur is not a problem the diets are going to be 0 0.2 but if you throw in 20 percent distillers average distillers now you're getting close to 0 0.3 which may or may not I'd still think about some adjustments but that's manageable but let's say you have 20 percent distillers and medium sulfate water I'll explain what medium is in just a second now you got an equivalent of 0.45 sulfur this is pro a problem high sulfur water now you're at 0.6 dietary equivalent these are significant issues both for copper selenium and decay uh, here's my definitions of medium and high sulfate water uh, 350 parts per million sulfate sulfur is like adding two two tenths of a unit to diet sulfur 700 is like adding 0.4 these are enough to make you you need to modify mineral require or mineral supply it also means you should get into the habit of taking water samples you don't have to do this every day or every week or every month but probably once or twice a year you should take a water sample see where you're at remember the sulf the if water has sulfate sulfur it interferes with mineral absorption just like dietary sulfur Okay, another break here. On now we're going to switch gears into the trace minerals. So, Mike, take take it away. Okay, well, very good, Bill. This is fascinating. I almost got, got I almost forgot you were coming up here. Anyway, get ready to vote here. Uh, we're looking at especially trace minerals, uh, rarely used, uh, especially minerals relying mostly on sulfates. This will be your first choice. Second, replace sulfates with specific minerals at the same amount of dye, same parts per million in the ration. Uh, replace sulfates with special organic minerals, but reduce the levels. Fascinating. Only use specific minerals in specific situations. And finally, the third, seventh choice, uh, fifth choice. I don't believe in it. I'm not going to use organic trace minerals. So this could be fun to see. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the poll, boy, Bill, you are really a nasty guy here on yeah, tough yeah, poll yeah. questions. They're making people think. That's right. I, I've got my pick, Mike. Oh, well, what's, what's, your, what's your, your, your pick here, Steve? Are, are you going to uh, well, fess up here or I not? like number, I like, actually, I like number four. Yep. The fourth one down, just for kicks. I'm going to vote for number three, but we'll see. Okay. Well, we'll see right. where this goes, see, goes um, at this point. See, anyway, we got. Uh, oh, we're close. Well, two we. Thirds. I'm, I'm going to keep it open until I win. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> okay, we've got two thirds in. Uh, Jim, let's close her off. And uh, uh, Dr. Bill, what do you? Uh, what's your your prognosis on this? Uh, but both the majority answers, the two high answers, are good approaches. Um, Special situations, if you're going to use them, that's a good time. But if you are going to use them more routinely, you have to take or you should take a, uh, uh, some, get some credit for this higher availability. That's what one, re one reason you're fe feeding these. So get some value from that. So I like answer three, but answer four also is quite acceptable. Okay, with copper. Requirement again, and these are just general. You're going to find it depends on the cow and the diet a bit, but 10 to 12 parts per million for copper. Okay, again, I, I want to do the count pointer count. You're going to say, I, I want to feed enough copper. It's been shown conclusively improve uh, mastitis or reduce mastitis, uh, cure, prevention, uh, mastitis prevention, also severity, improves immune function, been shown very clearly to do that. There's less data, but it's also been shown to reduce retained placenta. So all good reasons to feed enough copper. On the other hand, this is one mineral that is quite toxic uh, to ruminants, more so for sheep, but it's also quite toxic for, for cattle. It's one of my opinion relative to the requirement. It is the most toxic mineral we feed. And the toxicity is not simply cows going off feed. Uh, the, one of the first signs you see of copper toxicity is, is dead cows. Another issue here we have to be concerned with is this accumulation of liver copper. And I'll show some data. We're getting some of these livers, which is human edible food, 
um, not for me, but some people, it's it's becoming an issue. So why should you feed more? Well, there is real-world antagonists. Sulfur, as I mentioned, can tie up copper. We feed high, with distillers, feed more copper. With what, bad water, feed more copper. Reduced iron can interfere with copper. Some water has a lot of reduced iron. The data with grazing cattle, because of what we think is ingestion of soil, and probably more specifically clay, binds up copper. You need to feed more. And then again, high molybdenum. And NRC, again, because of, of difficulties in modeling all this, just assume minimal antagonist. And if you have these antagonisms, you have to feed more copper. But this is the, the issue I wanted to mention. This is a study out of New Zealand in which they were looking at how much does the liver keep accumulating copper as I feed more copper. And the answer is yes, it does. A liver here at 35, that's about where we like like them to be. And these cattle were fed a, a reasonable amount of copper. I can't remember exactly how much supplemental copper, but it was reasonable. And the point I want to make is the this is the accumulation of additional copper. And it, it basically says that these even at these cows that had high liver coppers, they continued to increased liver copper at about seven milligrams per kilogram each month. They didn't downregulate absorption enough. They continued to do this. And so with copper, we're not worried about you feeding too much copper for a week or two or a month. But if you're feeding too much copper from basically the time this calf is born to the time she leaves the farm, you can have substantial liver copper. And again, that's a risk factor for toxicity. So on, on copper, we need to be careful. There's, you don't want to be deficient, and there are some issues. But if you're feeding no or little or no distillers and have good water, just very moderate overfeeding, 20% extra, should be adequate. And that puts me in about the 15 to 18 parts per million range, and this is total diet. It's not supplemental. The copper in feeds have value. And if you are going to use these higher bio, bioavailability sources, feed less. Take advantage of the, the enhanced absorption. A lot of the companies will provide you relative absorption. They can say, relative to copper sulfate, my mineral is two times more available and show you the data. And how I'd use that is shown in this example here. Let's just say in this diet I need eight parts per million of supplemental copper to get where I want to go. If I'm going to use special copper and it's two times available, I'm only going to supplement four parts per million. So instead of in this ex with copper sulfate, my total diet is 18 because that was my goal. With the, the high availability copper, I'm only going to be formulating to 14. Um, with with bad bad water and distillers, you're going to bump it up con considerably, two to three times NRC, and I think very hard about using a high availability copper. And again, once in a while it wouldn't be a bad idea to get a liver sample from a cull cow and see where you're at. Uh, magnesium or manganese, I'm going to go quicker because I see I'm kind of running out of time. The NRC is clearly wrong with manganese. I think this is a problem with the maintenance requirement. The maintenance the requirement is 14 to 18. There was a study with beef fed at 18 and they saw clinical deficiencies, not marginal deficiencies, but clinical. And some balance work we've done uh, suggests that diets of 30 to 40 parts per million is more appropriate. So I think there's little question NRC for manganese is incorrect. For chromium, there was no requirement because it wasn't approved at that time. It's currently approved at 0.5 from chromium propionate only in the U.S. Other companies, other countries have different uh, sources. It is a required nutrient. There's no question on that. It's involved with insulin and glucose. Uh, there's data showing it reduces lipolysis in early lactation, which can stimulate feed intake. And in certain classes of immunity, not all, it enhances certain types of immunity. And this is via or most likely via cortisol. So there's some good biochemical reasons for feeding chromium. On the production data, 
most of these studies, and this is important, are start pre prepartum about three weeks and go to about four weeks postpartum. So that's early lactation only. Uh, typical supplementation rates are shown here. There's been 12 studies I could find, 30 different treatments. And I just summarized over here in the, the red box uh, frequencies. 10% of these studies, the cr cows fed chromium actually produced less milk than controlled. These may or may not have been statistically significant. 23% got less than a three pound response. But the rest here, two thirds of these treatment comparisons, you got more than a three pound increase in milk, which is, is probably profitable. Um, the, the big caveat here though is these studies are only in fresh cows. The, this is an expensive supplement and there's nothing wrong with spending money if you get a good return on investment. But we don't know what the response is if you're supplementing all your high cows. That will add tremendously to supplementation cost and you might not get added response. So if you have a fresh group three or four weeks in, in milk this might be something to consider. I guess I summarize that here. Um, based on current prices, this is profitable if it's fed to the, the to a fresh group. If you have different cow groupings, you need to consider this very carefully because again, it's an expensive cost per day. If you have to feed a lot of cows, you may not get the return on investment. So to wrap up here, there is a lot of uncertainty in both established in the requirements and availability. And so in my opinion, the uncertainty and risk man management justifies overfeeding, moderate overfeeding. I'm not talking two, three times NRC. But I think for a lot of these minerals, 20 to 50 percent extra is acceptable. Uh, other ones like phosphorus, I'll feed right at requirement unless I can use the phosphorus in manure and unless the high byproduct diets are cheaper. Safety factors should be farm specific and they should be mineral specific. You might feed exactly the phosphorus requirement on this farm, but you're going to feed two times more copper because there's a lot of sulfur in the water. Another farm, because you're less convinced of, of other management issues, you might feed more phosphorus because you're not convinced they're going to be getting that. You want a little margin of safety. So work with the producer, work with, uh, look at the entire uh, system here and the, all the minerals and, and make specific farm specific mineral specific recommendations. And don't forget there is a cost to substantial overfeeding long term. Feeding too much mineral for a day or two doesn't matter. Feeding too much copper for a year matters. So be aware that a lot of these trace minerals accumulation continues day in and day out. And lastly, I, I need to remind people that minerals in feeds have value. It's They don't go right through the cow. A uh, good example, deer don't die of all these mineral efficiencies and they don't aren't supplemented. So give credit to basal ingredients. Don't ignore them. And with that, um, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions or if there's any comments. And thank you for your attention. Well, very good, Bill. Uh, Steve, I'm going to turn it back to you. I, uh, Bill, can you hit okay. the next PowerPoint probably and to get rid of that Brutus guy? And <laughs> kind of ugly looking there. And, uh, <laughs> Steve, we'll, we'll let you uh, nope. make some comments. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you so much, uh, Bill, for a wonderful job. Lots of very practical, useful information. Lots of food for thought for uh, a lot of people. You had uh, well over 100 people online with us here uh, this afternoon, which is uh, a great... Uh, turnout and uh, a tribute to you and the topic. And uh, we also want to take this opportunity to thank ZenPro for their sponsorship of this webinar. And as you can see on the screen now, we're going to be looking ahead to an update on starch utilization on June 9th with uh, Wisconsin's uh, Randy Shaver. And then Mike Hutchins, our co-host, will be the presenter in July, uh, July 14, going after that next uh, five pounds of milk out there. So. We, uh, uh, again, Bill, thank you so much for your, uh, for your great job today. Uh, just a note to those of you that uh, are uh, with us that uh, in a couple of days you'll be getting a survey, uh, probably on Thursday, uh, emailed. Please uh, take a, just a few moments, that's all it takes, to uh, respond to that to help us keep 
our webinar series on target. We want to make sure that we're uh, meeting your needs. And also, there will be a short summary of this uh, webinar on our blog Wednesday. And that uh, blog, by the way, will include a link to this webinar so you can come back and take another look at it or share it with your coworkers at that time. And then it will be posted on our web archives by the end of the, of the week. So uh, we have great traffic to our web archives. More than uh, 36,000 people have visited our archive web, uh, the uh, web archive since we started our series back in 2011. So we have great uh, participation every time we have a live event and lots of archive usage for that as well. Mike, I think there are some questions out there. Do you uh, yes, want there are. To uh, take, a, take a look at them. Go ahead. Yeah, Bill, can you do one more click on your PowerPoint, and uh, that would be good. Uh, again, uh, Steve, any comments on our sponsorship at this point? Well, we do appreciate, of course, Zinpro very much for their support, and uh, we're uh, glad to have them as uh, as one of our partners. Very good. Uh, we do have a boatload of questions. So, Bill, either there was a great topic or you totally confused everybody. We'll leave it at that. But let's take them in the order and we'll see how far we get down the list. Uh, what about the availability of phosphorus in distillers' grains? Any adjustments uh, when using uh, distillers in terms of phosphorus levels? Uh, there's some work out of Virginia Tech. I'd say no big adjustments. There's nothing indicating it's that much different than other feeds. So I, I don't think any big adjustment is needed. It needs to be counted, but I don't think I consider it similar to other feeds. Okay, uh, next one, kind of interesting. Agronomists are pushing sulfur applications on forages and grain crops every year. Are you seeing any negative effects of this in terms of animal nutrition? Uh, in Ohio, we are actually, um, because of the Clean Air Act, um, the sulfur levels in soils and the sulfur levels in our forages are decreasing. Um, in alfalfa, it's a substantial decrease. So basal diets are trending down, at least in Ohio. So as they, I think as they add more sulfur fertilizer, these levels will go back up to what we're historically used to. So as long as they can over supplement and I are over fertilize, and some of these are high, um, so I don't I don't think some moderate fertilization is probably good for both yield and nutrient value. Uh, you might want to start analyzing some sulfur. That's not a common assay, but we find these some of these forages are substantially different from the book. So I'd suggest. Uh, if you are fertilizing, get some samples, run sulfur. Again, that's a special test. You'll have to ask for that specifically. Great answer. Bill, interesting question. If you are going to supplement selenium, should we use only the yeast or organic sources, or would it make sense to use some inorganic? That's a, a, a question I get a lot, and I, I have my opinion, and other people have their opinion, so you might hear oh, other other things. In general, I'm a proponent of a mixed source, um, and I don't have a, a, a specific recipe because I haven't seen the data, but 50-50, two-thirds, one-third, something like that, but a mix. The reason I think a mix of selenite or selenate and yeast is good is you're covering your bases. Uh, they're absorbed by different mechanisms. Um, there's some immune response directly to selenite. So I, I think a mixture, I, I, I tend to go higher in dry cows, more, more yeast to get good transfer to the fetus, and lactating cows, I tend to go a little heavier on the selenite. If sulfur is an issue, then I'd probably go all, all uh, yeast. But a mixture in normal conditions, I think, gives you the best response. Fantastic. Here's an interesting one. You mentioned uh, using copper under grazing conditions based on uh, clay ingestion. Any comments on mineral corrections, especially trace minerals, when using uh, some of the microtoxin products such like bentonite uh, uh, in terms of tying up? What's your thoughts, Bill? The, the clay binders will bind uh, divalent metals, so copper, uh, zinc, um, no question on that. Uh, and relative to the moles, we have to think now molecules, relative to the molecules of copper in a diet to the molecules of clay binding sites or the clay binding sites, it, it's enough. I would consider increasing copper. Uh, there's data for grazing cattle, says grazing cattle should be fed almost twice as much copper as, as uh, confinement cattle. 
uh, that date is a little little limited, but I, I wouldn't hesitate for a substantial increase in copper with with at least the clay-based myco mycotoxin binders. So maybe two times, uh, I think, might be a good a good approach. That's kind of a guess, but you do need to feed more. Very good, good answers. I see you're not you're not a Republican. You come directly with the end. You give us numbers. <laughs> I'm impressed rather than some hey, or none. You don't know the bumper sticker on my truck. You wouldn't say that. So. Okay, we will move on then. Uh, what minerals need uh, extra attention when cows drink water that's high in iron? In the past, uh, we would have been very concerned with copper and uh, selenium, and it has to do with not necessarily binding them up even though high iron can bind up copper absorption it's also high iron in the body is an oxidative load but some newer data out of Michigan State says the iron in water could probably be a little I, I never remember this number but it's, it's they fed substantially higher water and are not seeing big issues so I think it can be higher than what we were I think the old number was 0.3 in Michigan State's finding levels at least 10 times higher than that without big issues. But if you do have a lot of iron, and especially if high sulfate, that means a lot of this is iron sulfate, uh, switch to uh, selenium yeast and probably bump up copper. Okay, well, put your agronomy hat on. Uh, we, uh, question about applying ammonium sulfate to pastures as a, I assume, a nitrogen source. Is there a maximum amount I should use, or is there a way to balance so I don't need to have as, as much sulfur to the soil? Comments, Mr. Agronomist? Well, no, that one is out of my league. So I'm, I'm going to say, you know, they, I, I, I've just seen some data here, and I can't remember what it is. So I don't want to answer incorrectly, so I'm going to have to pass on that one. Okay, I can give, well, you a, give you a good agronomist here at OSU that can answer that question, but I can't. I really didn't realize they had good agronomists at, at Ohio <laughs> State. But anyway, we move on. Uh, put your lawyer hat on now then. Would you consider taking liver samples from healthy animals, say as you mentioned, voluntary cows or, or biopsies versus mortal mortality, cows that are dead? dead. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I would not. The you know, you you don't learn. You could if you suspected copper toxicity in cows abruptly died. It was a very sudden death. That's a possibility, and the only way to verify that is both blood or liver copper. And I, you, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you suspect that to get a sample to to confirm or deny that. Uh, for just health monitoring, of course, a dead animal is not the the appropriate animal to sample. Um, liver biopsies on healthy animals is fine. Um, it's you know, invasive and, and um, I don't like to do that very much, but it's fine. Um, it, liver samples on healthy cold animals will also work. And again, it's more of a monitoring one. If you're starting to see um, high copper in these, uh, in these healthy animals, you might want to back it down because again, it, it, it's not they're not accumulating a ton of copper in a day or a week it's just these very small amounts every single day but if if cattle are abruptly dead or very sudden death uh, copper toxicity is just one of many issues and again liver copper and blood uh, can help verify that diagnosis Okay, uh, here's one. Put your nutrition cap back on. When using 100% organic trace minerals, is feeding about 50% of the NRC requirement a good target, or should we aim for a higher levels? You, we need to quit lumping everything together. You know, uh, I, I did just for uh, speed here, but these are different compounds, different companies, different products. So. You need to make these product specific. A lot of these companies will be able to give you. Again, not true availability, but relative availability. And if Company X can show you that feeding, you know, the same amount of copper from their product as copper sulfate resulted in twice the liver concentration, you can assume it's twice as available, and cut it down. Uh, other products might be three or four times. So uh, that you, we can't think of all these together. Uh, and ask for data. And the good companies will be able to provide you, again, at least relative data. And I, I take the, in general, these do appear to be more available. Two, two times might be a good average, but take advantage of the data they have to, to fine tune the, fine tune your recommendations. 
If you're feeding, uh, another question, if you're feeding 20% DDGs, uh, how often should you analyze DDGs? Probably for, I think he's suspecting uh, sulfur and phosphorus. He makes a comment about oil as well. We're, we're doing a, a lot of work on feed variability. Um, and at right now, we would say with, with distiller grains, uh, and we did not include sulfur in this, this set of data, so I can't be specific on sulfur. But distillers is really not that much variable than other high fiber byproducts. It's similar in variability to brewers, um, similar in gluten. It's just that some of the bad things in distillers, when it varies, it makes it worse than these other ones. Um, theoretically, if we're from our our surveys of, of of feedstuffs, you should sample if you're getting it from what we call commodity distillers, which you just buy a load of distillers. You don't no branding, no anything. It's what came off the lot today. You need to sample every load at least twice. If you're getting uh, branded distillers where there's significant blending, uh, you may not need to, to sample it at all. But uh, commodity distillers, duplicate samples every load, at least. Okay. Mike, uh, let, I think we'll let me just step in here for a second, and then we'll get back to some additional questions if Bill is is willing. But we're right at the end of our our time slot, so uh, for the sake of those that uh, have to uh, leave us right away, I want to again uh, thank them for their uh, being a part of our webinar today, and also Bill Weiss, excellent job, uh, great job, uh, some real practical, useful information, and again another thank you to. Zinpro uh, for their sponsorship of the webinar and thanks to you Mike Hutchins down there at the University of Illinois and also Jim Baltz for his technical support behind the uh, scenes and we hope to have you back with us in uh, April uh, when uh, Rand or I mean June rather when uh, Randy Shaver will be bringing us a starch update now uh, Mike we still have almost a hundred folks with us out there and a few more questions so if you uh, Want to keep going, and Bill, if you're willing to hang on for another 10 minutes or so? That sounds fine. Okay. Uh, thanks. Go ahead there, Mike. Okay, very good. Well, we got three, I think, really good questions, then maybe a couple of comments that maybe, Bill, we'll just we'll pass along. What are your thoughts on uh, liquid mineral feeding? Now, metering, I assume he's talking about metering it into the water. Uh, will these be more available if they are soluble in water uh, sourced? The, the theory is yes. Um, Soluble, you know, one of the steps in absorption of minerals is, for most of these, is they have to be soluble. So for certain ones, I, I think there's a good relationship. Other ones, calcium, for example, probably much less so. Um, so men, the if you were feeding minerals via water, you should probably increase the absorption coefficients. How much? That's a, a good question. And I don't have an answer to, but they should be more available than the typical uh, mineral in that we supplement in the diet. Yeah, and I think you've answered this question, Bill. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but his question, uh, jumping down a bit, can cow, cows uh, use minerals in water? Are You assume these are much more available than feed sources, and are there more antagonisms than in some of the minerals found in water? Maybe you've answered that already. Um, there's no reason to suspect um, minerals in water are not available. Um, in most cases, the minerals are actually quite, we know, for example, sodium in water is very clearly available. The sulfur in water can, can interfere with things. We know that. Um, most waters are not high in, in trace minerals, so it's, a lot of this is not a, a big issue. I do not, in formulation, I do not incorporate that into my formulation. I just ignore that because I think, you know, a lot of these requirements, when they're established, they didn't account for the water, so there's a little bit of a cushion there. Antagonist, again, water sulfur is still the biggest, and, and that's because we know it's sulfate. Um, feed, is, feed sulfur is a mix of methionine, cysteine, and inorganic sulfur, and so the methionine and cysteine sulfur isn't nearly as antagonistic as the inorganic sulfur. So water sulfur is probably more antagonistic than total diet sulfur because of the chemical form. 
Here's a, a great question, uh, and, and he says very high producing herds, but I was saying producing herds. Should some blood work be done on different groups of animals uh, to monitor mineral status? It's in general for for most minerals, blood is not the best indicator. Um, calcium at, at calving is you know very good on on evaluating hypocalcemia. Uh, magnesium maybe a little bit. Um, selenium has some good value, but a lot of the other ones, copper, zinc, uh, manganese, we really don't know. In copper, we do know that basically it will look pretty good until the cow kilovers from a, a copper deficiency so it's very insensitive. Uh, manganese we, we, we've never had the technology actually to get good measurements until now so we really don't know what a good target is. So I'm not a, a big fan of, of routine blood sampling because I don't know what the data means. I think it, it's misleading uh, for many of them and it's misleading in the sense of false security. Uh, selenium, if of the of the minerals that I think have good diagnostic value, one would be selenium, and then calcium with respect to, to dry cow and hypocalcemia. Bill, this is Steve Larson. I assume that applies to hair too. Every once in a while, or every few years, somebody comes up with a scheme to analyze hair. Yeah, it's it's. Again, there is some correlation. Um, these trace minerals are absorbed and they're put into some proteins in hair. Um, it's, again, not, I, I don't know how well it's correlated to liver. I haven't seen it for quite a while. It's also, there's a lot of potential contaminants, um, soil and other things on, on hair. And it's also time related. Hair takes a long time to grow, and so when you take that sample, you might be evaluating the nutrition program six months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I'm not, to me, if, if you do want to evaluate it, liver is good, and blood is within limits, but hair, I think, has, has very limited value. Well, Bill, we, we have two questions, and then we're going to wrap up because you had God's honest truth here. You're losing ground here, fellow. <laughs> You're yeah. further behind now than when we started. But anyway, uh, this is a fun one. Is there a standard uh, relative bioavailability test for trace minerals and ruminants, and can we use that data then in monogastric animals? Thoughts on that? The answer is no. I wish th that's one of the problems where we just do not have good tests um, on bioavailability. It's these are very complicated experiments. Um, you know, we can look at cell uptake and other things, but no one has ever shown that's related to in vivo situations. So, uh, chemical tests are not appropriate because again, there's a lot of regulation. The cow does not absorb every molecule of copper it's fed because it can't or it doesn't want to. So very complicated and no, at this time there is no good laboratory or in, even in vitro test for bioavailability. The last question and then a couple of general comments. Any specific adjustments for growing dairy heifers on, on the mineral side of the equation? I, I'm a little less concerned. I think NRC NRC is always going to be the place I start. Some of these antagonists are just are are still there for heifers, but again, you you don't have this massive increase in metabolism for milk production. So I think it's a little more forgiving. And in general, if you compare say beef uh, NRC to dairy NRC for heifers, uh, a lot of these minerals are even a little bit higher for the dairy heifer. And I, so I think that I I'm, would make much smaller safety factors for growing heifers than I do lactating cows. But be aware, again, if you're feeding high sulfur diets or high sulfur water, you still have to make modifications for heifers just like for cows. Well, Bill Weiss, hats off to you. We still have 60 plus people thinking that your answers are good. Now, I know that I know that answer, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, ge a general comment from an agronomist uh, from one of our listeners, if he's still on, said to uh, split those nitrogen applications up into no more than 75 units. That's the ammonium sulfate question. And I know the gentleman, he's, he's, he's good. And then uh, another comment uh, about what would be the appropriate sulfur levels in pasture, Bill. I assume you don't, or you want to take a swing at that or just leave it alone? Uh, on the on the plant side or on the soil side? Uh, he says appropriate sulfur levels in pasture. So I assume it's the plant side. They they sh they're tied somewhat to protein because of, of these amino acids. But typically, if they're 0 0.2, 0 0.25 percent, that's probably a good good number. 
but if, if it's very mature and low protein, it's going to be lower. Um, there is, if you go to the OSU agronomy website, they've done quite a bit of alfalfa and sulfur lately. That would be a good place to start. Well, obviously, okay. Steve, it's time to cut this off. He's starting to go yeah. back to Ohio State. So, <laughs> Bill, thanks much. You've been you've been a pleasure yeah. to work with. Steve, any closing comments? Excellent, excellent job, uh, uh, Bill, and thank you again, Mike, and, uh, and of course, Sinbro.